We are live. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Martha. And welcome again today to uh, Hash Sales at EU. This is our third session that we've done, which is fantastic. I can't believe it's 33 already. I always say this, but uh, it's great to have everybody joining us on Twitter today. Welcome to everybody. Uh, today's guest, we're going to be speaking about writing skills. Now, I have to tell you that I went to one of the worst schools in the York area, which is in the north of England. So it's something I've had to really work at since I actually became an adult and joined the workforce. So it's a, it's a topic which I think is, is paramount. It's something that I, uh, I continue to strive to perfect. So um, I think this is a great topic. And I think it doesn't matter if you're in sales or if you're in marketing or customer service. Good writing skills are essential for anybody. So it's a great thing we have this topic today. And this is going to be with Coach Lee. Uh, Coach Lee is here. Hello, Coach Lee. Well, good, good afternoon, Richard. I'm back in the States, so it's morning here, but it's afternoon over across the pond, as they say. It is indeed. <laughs> and it's great to have you on today. Coach Lee's um, Twitter handle is at Coach Lee, so please, everybody, say uh, a good warm welcome to Coach Lee. Now, your website, if anybody wants to, to take a look at that for your, your increase in sales blog, is the increase-sales-blog.com. Have I got that correct? That is correct. Thank you for sharing that. Fantastic. <laughs> That's great stuff. So today we're going to talk about writing skills. You you specialize in small business, which is under 50 employees. That's which correct. Is a huge market. Uh, in fact, if you look at the the GDP produced per organizations and the number of people employed by that that segment of the marketplace, it's the bull cover. I think it's also one of the most challenging as individuals because it's at that stage where it's mostly owner entrepreneurs, so it's owners of the business. So they're very focused on the pennies or the cents, as I guess you would call them over there. <laughs> um, so it's a hard to target to market to, and it's a hard market to, to engage with, yet it's critically one of the business drivers for the, our economies, and that's the economy with the UK, Europe, or in the US. So why don't you talk to me a little bit about your market and the challenges they find? Well, I can only speak from personal experiences that when I became an entrepreneur 18 years ago or so, um, I really enjoyed my solutions. I enjoyed training and, and working with companies. And the revenue was kind of hit and miss. And after about five years, I realized it was marketing. And I think marketing is still the number one challenge for any small business, especially those under 100 employees and really those under 20 or 10 employees. How do you attract attention? And, and yeah. that becomes a real barrier. So back in 2005, I started writing articles with, for ezinearticles.com, and then I connected with Evan Carmichael of evancarmichael.com, and eventually Jeb Blunt of Sales Gravy. And Jeb's one who pub and through him I was able to publish a book, and and still marketing today is really hard, because there are so many people out there with similar solutions, all vying for the same you know piece of the pie. Yeah, I think that's right. I don't, I don't think necessarily. It's, I guess this first comes down to, down to your your writing skills as well, being able to articulate your position to the actual marketplace as well. Um, yeah, I think. That's spot on. So, fantastic. Thank you for very much for that introduction. We'll dive straight into the first question so we can, we can get the ball rolling. It's an easy one to begin with. Why is writing as an important skill to the sales practice as other skills, such as negotiating, fact-finding, or even presenting? What, why is it so important? I, th I think it's really important because, going back to how you started this conversation, the majority of firms out there with a hundred employees or more are like 0.5 percent of all businesses, at least here in the U.S. It yeah. is those small firms that have under 10 employees that do not have the capacity, the capability, the resources to hire those big marketing firms that will write the copy, that will do the posting. And, and so writing is really essential to one, have clarity of thought, how do you stand up and differentiate yourself very clearly, succinctly in 30 seconds, 60 seconds, or when you're having that first one-on-one -on -one meeting with your ideal customer? 
and also writing allows for you as an individual to have greater clarity as to how you can find that niche that will differentiate you, that will allow you to go into that, what they call that blue ocean, instead of being in that red ocean. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's critical. And it's not only just the, the pictures you need to think about, it's actually across the board, whether it's in your uh, simple things, like your, your website, it needs to be articulate, it needs to be clear and concise. Uh, I, I read a lot of websites where the basics aren't done, you know, there's spelling mistakes, there's grammar mistakes, etc. And they're easy to fix. And then you turn around and look at it and think, I'm not quite sure what you do. So I think the, the whole process of being able to write clearly and without jargon is a critical thing. And we're in the CRM industry, so it has to be said <laughs> we're full of jargon. And particularly if you're talking about sales process as well, we get even more jargon. So being able to articulate uh, well in a written form, I think, is, is, is a key matter. I think Eric Cornstorm, our, our CMO, he, he likes to quote, um, uh, I think it's Aristotle who says, if you can't explain it, not Aristotle, it's um, Einstein. If you can't explain it simply, then you don't understand the subject matter well enough. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think sometimes people get caught up in the fads and the latest jargon. And it, and it, 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 it even exposed in the email, I mean, with the customer relationship management system, which Pipeliner is, it will capture all those emails, all that co correspondence. And does the other person really truly understand what you're saying to him or her? Yeah. And you need to be able to get that message across, and that, of course, comes through writing. And I have to say, uh, it's a turn off for me when I turn around and receive an email, and it's, and it's poorly written. You can forgive some mistakes in it, but if it's, you know, the basic sentence structure isn't there, the eyes are all in the small case, for example, is it? Oh, <laughs> that I have. You know, and then you even take it to the next stage where you think about somebody's LinkedIn profile, which is, of course, the digital brand. And if that's not well written, it reflects even further across. You're right about LinkedIn. I was reading that they're saying one third of all professionals are now on LinkedIn. So yeah. it, that is becomes a, a very ideal target market for many B2B organizations as well as B2C. Absolutely. Cool. Let's see what our talk, audience is talking about. Writing is important as skills because it gives you the brand ability to communicate with your audience in their language. Absolutely. I think being able to, so how do you feel about writing and being able to put that across into somebody else's language? So being able to couch the language correctly, how do you go about doing that? I, my sense is there, your voice, how you talk one-on-one -on -one with someone, being able to translate that into written word. I think answers that question. You yeah. have to be authentic as to who you are. <clears throat> it's not out there attempting to be somebody else, looking at what they wrote and attempting to articulate it. It's you and it's your authentic voice because people buy from people they know and trust. And if they feel that you're not authentic, how can they trust you? How can they get to know you? Absolutely. I think I would completely agree with that. And I think we see that a lot, particularly in the content marketing industry, where there's a great deal of plagiarism which takes place, or simple regurgitation of somebody else's tips and tricks and rewritten as yourself. And I, I, I never understood, I can understand to a certain extent why people want to do that, because it makes it easy. But I've never found that the, the easy stuff particularly turns around and resonates with my customers or with uh, the community that follows me on LinkedIn or Twitter, etc. It's one of those things where you need to, you do exactly as you say, you need to put your interpretation on it, your personality stamp on it, to make it engaging so people understand you. And, and I think you it's a key point of easy. If it was easy, everybody could do it well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and when, you know, if you have some of the right tools, the content aggregators where you can, you know, use Google to find um, certain keywords coming up every day, then you can research that and bring a whole fresh perspective. Uh, recently I, I wrote on LinkedIn about sustainability and leadership from an entirely different perspective. It received a lot of comments and that's how you differentiate yourself. You don't yeah. need to regurgitate what everybody else has said. I mean if I read one more article on value creation, I think I'm going <laughs> 
to have some sort of illness. You know, because they're all saying the same stuff. So yeah. if you can be contrarian, and I don't believe in value creation, so and I can be a contrarian, I'll write about I don't think it exists. So sometimes writing contrary as long as you believe it is a way of differentiating yourself and actually ha educating yourself. Yes, absolutely. I think the education part is, is the important thing because of course everybody else wants to educate themselves as well and that's part of the reason why I'm doing this. And if you're simply regurgitating what everybody else is saying and just following the pack, and you know there is some merit in that because it could be generally your thoughts as well, but if you don't turn around and step out and lead, then how can you be a thought leader if you are not turning around and coming out with your own thoughts and your own cogitations? I agree with you 100%. <laughs> fantastic. We've got a lot of agreement coming back from the boards as well, so that's good. That's fantastic. Okay, we'll move on to question two. Some people believe writing is a marketing skill. Well, I have to say that marketing should have the skill of writing. It's a key ingredient for that. <laughs> and it's not a sales skill, uh, which I would say I would disagree with. How do you explain this potential disconnect or discrepancy between the two? I think it goes back to the old New York advertisers who segmented marketing outside of the sales process. For me, the sales process is three phases. It's, it's marketing, attracting attention, beginning to build a relationship, it's selling, getting in front of your ideal customer for that coveted face-to-face -face first fact-finding meeting, working through the, the questions, the objections, presenting the case, earning the sale, and then the third phase is keeping, you know, keeping that customer coming back or helping that customer connect with other people and eventually that customer will give you referrals. So when marketing was, was taken away from the sales process, that is where the disconnect started. Because yeah. until people know about you, you can't sell them anything. You will remain pocket poor <clears throat> all day long. Yeah. I think mean, it's, it's the old silos of business, isn't it? And then the uh, and now, of course, we all talk about sales and marketing alignment, when in fact they should intrinsically be part of the same the same ship, effectively. And and I and also I think what has happened, especially for small businesses, it's been my experience, they have no plan. I get no. calls all the time about I want to work on my marketing, and my first question is, who's your ideal customer? <laughs> and, and, and they can't answer that. So the next question is, do you have a strategic plan? They go, well, no, I want a marketing plan. And I'm, I'm kind of shaking my head like, okay, let's put the horse before the cart. Um, it doesn't make sense because plan, in my experience, is a four-letter dirty word for business people, along with goal. You know, they don't want a plan. They want to be Captain Wing It. You know, spray their actions all over the place and pray something sticks. <laughs> well, of course, sales tends to be very numbers orientated, because, and hence we have cold calling still, because uh, it's about banging out the number of activities to be able to do that. I think uh, Rachel Millis just commented that writing is a communication skill. Absolutely. But at it the is. heart of sales is communication. So therefore, why wouldn't it be at the heart of sales? And that's a very good and salient point to make. And, and Zig Ziglar said, sales is a transference of feelings. You know, we can't, we can't go up and kiss people <laughs> to show them we feel. How do we communicate with them? We communicate verbally and we communicate through the written word. I mean, yeah. you, and I, you, were you and I were talking before this um, hangout went live and we're talking about the differences between the U.S. and Europe as far as social media. Absolutely. And my comment to you was, with all the great writers in Europe, you think Europe would have embraced social media long before the States. And, and I was surprised. And you do have a few decent authors yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do too. But I mean, if we want to look at the heritage of writing, um, yeah. we are we are a little younger country, uh, you know, than Europe and some of the other, you know, the Pacific Rim countries. So I'm just kind of surprised that writing, which is, you know, been done for years, is um, not within the context of the European businesses. Yeah, um, I think it's certainly seen as a, a nice to have rather than something that's critical to have still. And uh, given the, the proof of concept that 
I've seen myself with uh, Pipeline up with Eric as a CMO, Rachel and Alison leading with the influencer marketing, which is cornerstoned off good content, etc. as well. Although it's obviously not all of it. That whole writing has led to uh, fantastic product position for ourselves and has led to uh, a direct increase in web traffic and therefore leads which come into our, into our organization. And certainly the sales and marketing alignment has increased because the content going out is is aligned to what our audience needs. And, and the key word there is alignment. Yeah, absolutely. It has to be aligned to your solutions as well as to your research about what your customers or potential customers are seeking. Yeah. That's interesting you said about value creation, though, because uh, if you don't believe in value creation, obviously value is, is subjective, but clearly somebody is finding some value from it. So can you, can you dig back into that slightly for me? Well, I'm pretty literal, maybe because I'm a writer. Creation means to bring into existence, which means for me nothing existed before. Value is unique to each person. So what salespeople do, I, in my sense, we connect or we can add value, but we're connecting to the value drivers of the decision makers. What's important for them? Because the example I use a lot of times is <clears throat> my husband collects relic pre-World War I rifles, and he has one that could have been used by Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. And someone said to him, well, if Teddy Roosevelt had used this gun, would it have value for you? And he goes, no. His value driver is that all the serial numbers must match, and there's like four or five of them. So if the serial numbers don't match, the gun does not have value for him. So that's what I mean. You know, somebody could all day long create value, but if it may, if that value is not inherent to us, it doesn't make a difference. Why will someone spend forty thousand dollars here in the states to go to a private high school when they have a top local public school? I mean, someone could tell me everything all day long of why I have to spend $40,000 to go to a private school, and I would look at them and go, are you nuts? <laughs> <laughs> Especially if my school is good and I don't have to spend 40000 I can redirect that fund into a college education. So well, that I, doesn't I, come down to value, value creation, where yeah, it's, somewhere well, the school has got it right in terms of being able to present themselves as being more valuable. Well, but that's adding value and presenting it, but they could sell, they could say anything all day long, and to me, that, that does, it makes no difference. I'm not going to buy a $40,000 annual tuition for a high school. It's just, it's just to me, it's ludicrous. It's, you know, it's, it's like, do you buy a big house or a small house? You can sell me all day long and create value while you need to live in a big house. I'm a minimalist. I don't want a big house. I don't want to dust it. I don't want to clean it. <laughs> so it, <laughs> it, you know, now if you can, you know, make it energy efficient, okay, fine. I've already conscientious about that. That's a value for me. Okay, I'll start listening more. And I know it's semantics, but it goes back to the word create means to bring into an existence. And if, okay, you, bring, so. and if you bring it into existence and I don't see it as having value, it makes no difference from my perspective. And again, so I'm a contrarian. So perhaps the better term would be value alignment. That that's fine, or value adding value. You know, if I believe um, sustainability is important in my business, and you can show me how, you know, by your solution is going to add more value to my perception of sustainability, fine. But if I don't believe sustainability is important in my business, you can mm -hmm. sell me yeah. sustainability all day long, and I'm not going to buy it. Absolutely. So I think, you know, you know, value alignment, um, value adding value, I think those are very doable terms. I just don't believe in value creation. Excellent. Yeah, I think I understand where you're coming from. It is about that alignment and adding the value. And, of course, the written skill of being, from our perspective today, of being able to turn around and articulate that to your potential customer in alignment with what they perceive as value so that, you seem to be as an organization aligned with their goals. And, and just one little other caveat, when people start thinking they create value, I'm fearful their ego starts going before they open the door. 
<laughs> and so what happens is, well, I know how to create value because of all my other customers, and they may miss what the actual value drivers are for this new customer. So Yeah, that, that is one of the troubles we, we do have in sales is, of course, we're now continuously being programmed to look for insights and the ability to turn around and recognize uh, an insight from one person is not necessarily an insight for the next one. Absolutely. Excellent. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Well, uh, we have, sorry, Ch sorry, Richard, hello. <laughs> I have to say something, please. <laughs> um, James mentioned also a, a question for Julian. Um, he, is, he asked, how do you define a contrarian? A contrarian to me is someone who um, challenges the status quo, what everybody else is saying and presents a different perspective. So there's two elements there. It's one challenging and then presenting an alternative. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we just call them awkward <laughs> <laughs> or difficult. <laughs> no, I think, I think the, the ability to turn around and have that contrary view, where you can turn around and help to lead the pack, or at least help formulate the questions and the answers by just not pulling everybody in the same direction without the right questions being asked in the right time in the right way. We should question what we're doing. And that and being able to get that succinct view means we can turn around and understand the greater issue and the greater plan and therefore what the answers are to what we're trying to achieve. And I think sometimes when you are a contrarian, when you're challenging what you're hearing in a very emotionally intelligent way, your ideal customer, your your sales lead may all of a sudden recognize that their perception of what they think the problem is isn't really the problem. Because people reach out to me to increase sales, for example, and yeah. having conversations in about 15 minutes, the contrarian me goes, well, sales isn't the problem. It's a symptom of these other problems, misalignment in operations, misalignment between sales and marketing, and usually just some ineffective leadership. Yes, there's a lot of that which takes place. Don't get me started on sales and leadership in particular because it's probably hot of mine and uh, tomorrow's at the moment. <laughs> let's move on. So let's go back to question three. Content marketing is now context marketing. What does this mean for the small business owner and sales professional? I, I think for the small business owner and sales professional, it's going to make it easier for them because now they can write about <clears throat> what they know and how they can connect to their ideal customers. They're just not writing about anything, but they can really niche themselves and specialize in those segments of their particular industry. So I think it's a win for them and for those writers who have been engaged in content marketing. The really good ones have been doing context marketing from day one. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. Um, dating myself again, but I used to do that all the time on CompuServe, as it was in those <laughs> days. And, uh, and you know, we just used to have websites. We didn't have blogs. They were just websites which had a great deal of content. And we called them "How Do I Guys?" Effectively. So it's 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 not actually anything new. It's just a different terminology for it. And I think a lot of the fear that comes from the writing is that per perception that it's something new and scary when it's always been around. And it's always been good to chase after your niche so that you understand exactly who who your who your ideal customers are, because that's who you're gonna sell to. Sure. Okay, let's move on to question four, because it's twenty four minutes past already. Uh, what are some positive results from embracing writing as a sales skill? I think the best positive results is clarity. Yeah. When you have complete clarity about what you do, how you do what you do, and you can articulate that both in verbal and written messages, you will differentiate yourself. You won't be stumbling about with the ums and the ahs and kind of looking down at your feet at that networking event nor will you be telling people your most ideal lead is anybody with a pulse. Um, 
I actually heard that last week. You'll have clarity. And that and clarity is essential in sales. You need to know who are your ideal customers and what do they want to hear. Yeah. And and the other thing about writing is if you do it well, you create that emotional link to people. People buy like on person. emotions. Yeah. You know, that's what's going to make them run up to you and want to know why is pipeline or CRM better than anybody else. Absolutely. What are you doing for your customers that they're being able to get more sales than somebody else? Yeah, in fact, um, I don't have a link to hand, but there are some studies which have been done which show that actually in a business-to-business -business environment, the it is somewhat more emotional than just a business-to-consumer purchase. Because when you buy uh, something as an individual, you affect yourself. That's it. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You can always buy a new one or go without. But when you turn around in business to business environment, it affects your business. You can get fired, which is a much bigger call. There's a lot of connotations which come with it. So that articulation is absolutely critical. And relating that back to the emotional appeal and aspect of it, I think, is is what people need to get to and how they need to turn around and start, start selling and engaging from a written point of view. And I find that hard to do. Um, because of my background, but it's something I try to do all the time. And I think there's another aspect here about writing is it builds credibility for you. When you can have clarity and articulate what you do, you can be spontaneous. Um, when the young lady said to, who sat next to me and stood up and said her best sales lead was anybody with a pulse, I was able, I came next and I said, my best sales lead is anybody with a pulse and some money. And you, 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 can, you can create that emotional connection and then you can go into a little bit more detail of what you do. But if you're so focused on saying exactly what you think you need to say, you lose those opportunities for engagements. And when I made my comment, everybody in the room chuckled and smiled. So I had emotionally engaged with them. Absolutely. So how do you get to that? Because that's quite a difficult thing to do. How do you, what's, how would you go about doing this? First thing is, I, my sense is you listen. You listen to what other people say. You, you listen to TED Talks. You go to workshops. You listen at networking events. Then you connect with someone and you practice. You find a mentor. You find a colleague. You work mm. back and forth. Because the, the, the spoken words are a little different than the written words. However, they're united. They're, that becomes your authentic voice again. And it takes time. I mean, to think that you're going to emotionally engage with people the first time out of the gate, I think, is a mistake. Some people do it. Maybe they are the ones who have practiced. Another thing I always encourage people go to, you know, the local Toastmasters. I don't know what they have in Europe, but find groups where you can practice your speeches. So you feel confident. That's the other aspect. When you know what you're talking about, there is an innate confidence inside of you. And and that's going to come yeah. out. So I guess that's how I would suggest, but it does take time. I mean, you're continuing to work on yours, I'm continuing to work on mine. I'm always listening. What are people reacting to? You know, what's going on? How can you connect? And look for the smiles. Look for the body language. Oh, they like that. Yeah, you can work that back in. I think you're absolutely correct. I think that's one of the the current trend, whether it's social or whether it, and it has been for a long time within the sales profession, is you need to when you're engaging with people, you need to listen more and more because those are the cues with which you can pick up on and then relate everything back to people whether it's emotionally logically or however you want to do it it still enables you to do that fantastic um, so when we're talking about the results of sales writing uh, particularly when you're turning around and dealing with business jargon there's a lot of people out there who do use terminology, etc. How do you turn around and get people to write simpler, more readable text? Does that matter or is that really just something for writing purists? No, I think simplicity does matter. In fact, I did some research on LinkedIn 
And LinkedIn Pulse platform is a little different than the normal blogs out there or a book. And one of the um, research items I found is that the people who are reading LinkedIn Pulse are reading at what they hear in the States call an eighth grade level. They're, wow. And I write a lot of times at a college level, so I've had to kind of dummy down my writing. Not It's not the vocabulary as much as making the sentences shorter, um, bullet points. And, yeah. and it makes sense because people don't have a lot of time. So if time is an essential factor, how do we make it easier for them to digest what I'm saying? And I, and, I think, and I think that becomes part of your writing style. You can write very well, and you don't have to just write in one-syllable words, and you don't have to use multi-syllable words. It's just understanding your, your target audience. That's right. In fact, I think the um, Lincoln's inaugural speech, one of the best speeches ever written, if you actually analyze the speech, it's what, 505 words, 715 words in total or something like that, 505 of which are single-syllable words, and 120 of which are two-syllable words. So none of it was complex. And I think that's that's absolutely how you, you can get to engage with people. And that's a great, a great uh, difficulty for some of us who could be considered over-educated or too much in one market place for a long time, where we, we do overcomplicate things and it's not necessarily correct. And, and I think we're, we're, we're also educated to believe speaking simply is showing a lack of intelligence, yeah. where speaking simply can be a demonstration of intelligence. Absolutely, and uh, you, you certainly do get a lot of uh, testosterone and built into that way. You get a lot of one-upmanship and uh, competitiveness tends to come out. But who, who knows the biggest word or the most unusual word? <laughs> There's a great tool actually, which I'll just mention, which is Grammarly. So Grammarly is um, it's a web-based tool, and you can stick it onto your Chrome toolbar. I think they've got a plugin for Firefox as well. The basic version is free of charge, which is great, and that turns around and automatically does grammar checking for you as you're typing, so if you're doing your blog, fantastic. Even if you're doing your Twitter posts, it checks them as you're going along for grammar and for spelling, and it even turns you around and says it does a plagiarism check as well. So you can make sure you haven't <laughs> copied somebody else's text, even by accident, because let's face it, there are only so many ways of writing things, and that's, that's, that's a tool I use all the time, basically. That's a great way of checking things on the fly to try and reduce those errors that you've got. That makes perfect sense. Um, we have another question from Ch again from James. Um, for you, Leanne, how do you write for the Twitter platform in 140 characters or less? That, carefully. <laughs> <laughs> well, carefully <laughs> is one thing. I think also understanding some of the hashtags, um, keeping it simple. Uh, there's some research out there if you can write about using only a hundred or hundred and ten characters that allows for your tweets to be retweeted. Yeah. So you have to render it down to its basic elements and if you can throw it a little emotion you know like curious about put in the link or put in the hashtag that you know, may get retweeted. So there is a strategy behind Twitter that I think a lot of people don't employ within their marketing or their selling, and they get carried away. You know, I think with Twitter, less is more, less than 140 characters. <laughs> yeah, it does get hard, and you have to watch for that. Certainly, when you're when you're hoping to be retweeted, because of course that shows you the engagement, etc., from within your audience. Uh, you have to leave them at least the space to turn around and have your name with RT at the beginning, etc. Uh, so you can't take 140 characters even if you want to. But it's uh, yeah, it's interesting to, to hear you say about emotional words because of course you can just play with words to alter single phrases and the, the context then changes dramatically and how people perceive it just because uh, you've got a different word like curious or uh, a question mark at the beginning. And the other thing, too, is use a Word document so that you can see how many characters you've used. You know, practice your writing on a Word document. Uh, use 
automation tools where you can plug that tweet in several days because people change when they're on Twitter. You know, it may be when they're at a, a, at a stop sign or it may be when they're meeting at a meeting waiting for someone to attend. So, you know, even though they say morning is early, um, early afternoon, don't do anything after five, you never know. So by plugging your tweets in it during numerous times, I think gives you more exposure and potentially having your ideal customer finally see your tweet. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations for going to, to find out how to be a good writer? You know, starting off with the basics, business letters, then emails, then, then of course blog writing as well. I, th I th think read people that, that you find exciting. Read others, and if you like how they write, analyze it. What are they doing? Yeah. And then, in your own voice, make it your own. You know, um, we were talking earlier, you know, Einstein. I mean, Einstein was great with short little quotes. Yeah. Um, highly retweetable. Yeah, highly retweetable. That, and, and again, I mean, even on Twitter, find some good quotes that reflect you and share them if you're concerned about what to say. But again, it has to be in your authentic voice. So people know, you know, hey, Richard is really knows about, you know, CRM because he's sharing or he knows about the European marketplace. So I'm yeah. going to follow him. And yeah, and that, and it and it is it is it is the context of the content that's going to differentiate your tweets from somebody else. Yeah, and I think it's difficult, um, particularly on social media way, um, quite often people are rushed for time. And they want to just make sure they're getting the tweets out there or the LinkedIn post, whatever it happens to be. And then you start sharing stuff which you don't fully agree with, but you don't explain that in your post. And that's, uh, I think it's critical to, if you're going to post it, if you don't agree with it, say so and why. And if you do agree with it, fantastic, you know, that's great. But you can only do that by reading these things, of course. Turning around and just over automating and posting stuff out automatically, I don't think it's good. Well, I, I think also it goes back to your communities. You know, what communities are you in? And I'm in a couple different communities. I share their their tweets, their posts. I haven't read them all. That's okay. I trust them. I've read most of them. I know them. Do I agree with everything? No. But if we agreed with everything we shared, it would be a pretty boring world. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and sometimes if you don't agree, a lot of times I'll just put interesting posts with a question mark. And yeah, that'll that be enough. Encourages debate then, absolutely, yeah. which is good. And that comes back to being contrary. You want that debate to be able to solidify a position or a question so that you get the right answers at the end of the day. That's a good thing in my book. Absolutely. OK, so uh, can writing be outsourced then? What about, there's lots of ghost writers out there. Um, I have to admit, I have used them in the past. Uh, if so, what kind of advantages or disadvantages do you find? I think the greatest advantage for outsourcing is time. If you have somebody else writing, then you can devote your time to doing what you do best. Okay, I think that's the number one advantage. <clears throat> the disadvantage is it's potentially not your voice, and yeah. people may notice that. The other disadvantage is, is, is social media is so dynamic, it's changing day to day. And if you're contracting out a freelancer who's writing about a topic that's going to be published two weeks down the line, two weeks down the line may be too late. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So if you if, want to be immediate and on time. If you want to be immediate. And, and so there, there has to be some flexibility. The other thing to have to be concerned about is what you talked about earlier is plagiarism and duplication of content. Mm. You know, a lot of people will hire ghost writers, freelance writers to write their newsletters. Um, and there are subscription newsletter services. Well, that newsletter is going out to a lot of people, and some of those people may get the same newsletter. The header may change or something, but the content's the same. So how does that differentiate you from everybody else? And, yeah. it, and, it, and it becomes a challenge. You just And you have to know this going in, so if you're going to hire a freelance or a newsletter service, ask them, you know, are you sending newsletters to, you know, some of your clients just to ensure that you don't look foolish because it's under your name, under your company name, 
And some people may presume you're writing it, but a lot of the small business owners are probably thinking, well, you wrote that. You know, they're, they're, they're not as sophisticated as <clears throat> what we want to say the companies with 100 employees are more aware, you know, okay, fine, we know this goes on, that's okay. Yeah. And, yeah, I think if you're talking about, particularly with subscription-based newsletter type services, I, I, whilst it's relatively cheap to do, what's the value you're getting from it from a return on investment point of view? Um, what value does it bring to your customers? Because if you're not bringing any value to them or aligning or adding value, then what's the point? A newsletter is a mechanism to engage with your customers, prompt discussion and engagement with them. It's there to make sure they don't forget about you and they trust, build up trust with you as an organization. I used to write a four-page newsletter. I'm down to one page. <laughs> you know what? Uh, we have the same problem at Pipeliner sometimes. Our, 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 our marketing literature can be a little long, should we say. When it gets to 20 pages, our e-books, the problem is my prospects aren't going to read that because it's just a too long for most of them. But we do, you know, we produce some fantastic insights, but they're a bit of a read sometimes. But the shorter ones are brilliant because people just don't have the time these days, I think, to, to sit down and go through everything we might produce. So in, so in, in, in your writing, <clears throat> again, if you can add value, what are they looking for? Maybe, you know, throw in, they're looking for a good app on their smartphone. Yeah. Uh, they're looking for a good quote. Um, what, you know, would make their life a little easier? How can you educate them better? That, yeah. That um, the goal. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the reasons why we do this, because it's fantastic for getting, for sharing knowledge and information across uh, our community, basically, whether the prospects or customers or, in actual fact, some competitors on here as well. It, it's a great thing to do, and I think, you know, where I've mentioned Grammarly, if somebody wants to take that, put it that in their newsletter, uh, Rich Joe recommended this on uh, a Twitter chat on Google Hangout we recently had, fantastic, you know, great. It's, I think that's adding value to everybody then, and that, that helps. Uh, I think it all helps us all get smarter, and if you talk about sharing economies, etc., it works. Right, let's move on to question six, context and personalization in writing. Is it a must for successful social media ex activities? And explain why. I, th <clears throat> I think social media is all about personalization. It's often not, though, is it? Let's face it. Well, no, it's, 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 <laughs> no, it's not. But I mean, it's social media is a marketing channel, first and foremost. We yeah. have to, I think we have to accept that. And social media differentiates as a marketing channel from the other marketing channels with one word, engagement. Yeah. So when you engage, you are becoming personally involved in that communication process. And, and that's where the context comes in. If you can engage with relevant context as to what's happening, then that makes a lot more sense. Um, here in the States, we had the big brouhaha with Brian Williams and um, NBC and Lies and whatnot. And several people wrote some really good, relevant postings about how, you know, this relates to business. Everything yeah. from, you know, le poor leadership to the lack of ethics. So that's where it really becomes personal in a contextual manner. But it can make differentiate you from everybody else who might out there be dumping on poor Brian Williams for lying. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not and please, I'm not saying that, you know, to lie is good, but if you, you know, pull it apart a little bit more, you can see that, you know, he firing him, well, or putting him on suspension, whatever, is not the real problem. No, it's a wider issue. It, there was a much bigger issue, but sometimes we jump on the bandwagon and we look at the on the surface and we don't dig a little deeper. So social media allows for you to dig a little deeper and show that you are a forward thinker, regardless of what your industry is. Well, I want to connect with that person because they're thinking a little differently and maybe they will help me a little differently because what in the work what what has worked in the past doesn't work today. Does that yeah. make sense? Yes, it does. <laughs> uh, I think that does make sense. It's, it comes across clearly. Uh, 
I think Rachel Miller just pointed out social media is not a marketing channel, it's a communication channel. Yeah. Uh, I guess I, that is correct, because if you turn around and look, think about email, then you could easily turn around and say, well, email is marketing. But it's not just marketing, it's much, much wider complex than that. And there's a lot of poor email marketing going on as well. <laughs> Isn't that just, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, yes, I see that Twitter's just brought into effect mass direct messages, which are already full of spam, so it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see what happens on the writing front in that, and see how much that, how much personalization they can put into 140 characters to me on direct messaging. And, and again, that goes back to the consistency of your clarity as a salesperson, the consistency of your clarity regarding your values, what you will or will not tweet or retweet, or write even. Yeah. Um, who do you connect with? <coughs> you know, do you automatically connect with everybody, or do you, you know, have you invested the time to be selective in who you connect with, whether it's on Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever social media channel? Yeah, you see, I think particularly with uh, Twitter and LinkedIn, and to a certain extent Facebook as well, because the, the text is shorter, it does give you the, the, the opportunity to engage with them in the written form without having to feel like you're you're having to do too much without pushing you to turn around and write paragraphs of information in a reply you can be fair, you can be very succinct and to the point because the, those platforms are succinct and to the point in their nature and I, I think there's well, this personalization just made me realize there's one other element we haven't talked about in writing and that's emotional intelligence mm. when when you understand emotional intelligence and ch start changing the words you use, you're, you're better able to engage with others and you're also <clears throat> recognized as not being that negative person but that insightful, thoughtful person. Yeah. Should I be worried about the fact that you're talking to me and then decided you needed to mention emotional intelligence? <laughs> no, it just <laughs> came up. <laughs> And, and, it, and no, and, and you have been very emotionally intelligent. It's just that a lot of the small, the market I write for, that small business owner, a lot of them are, are unaware of emotional intelligence. And it's and it's just even you know coaching people. How do I write a good email? Um, you know, I, I always tell people write the guts, put something soft in the front, put something soft at the end, and if it's more than six sentences, you need to give them a phone call. Yeah, I think that's the absolutely right. I think that's probably in in sales, particularly with the millennial workforce coming through, etc. Uh, the the key aspect there is, you know what? If it's too long, just call them. Mm -hmm. There's nothing beats engagement than a telephone call or a visit. In actual fact, but telephone is much easier, and as is email before that. And and as well as when you have to leave that voicemail, are you leaving a clear, concise voicemail? that you've probably, if you've thought about it, you already have worked that out on the written word and eventually it, it may sound, it may be a script but it has some flexibility so you're not pausing and humming and umming in that voicemail and that's going to create an emotional disconnect for someone. Yeah, I mean it gives you that, the whole thing about learning things for example, of course you write it down. You don't type it, you write it because it helps to etch it on your memory better than typing or just reading it. And the fact you can do that also, as you've said already, helps you to articulate and be clear about what you want to communicate to the person you're calling or speaking to. So I think that comes back to your, where you said you've got the pictures at the beginning. You know, you can't do that unless you understand exactly what you want to say. And having it written down in front of you by writing it down helps that tremendously, I think. I, I agree. Writing is so powerful. Physically writing, whether and even extending that into writing a handwritten note to someone. Yeah. I, I've fact, had, I've had to back, yeah. in working with clients, I ask them, well, did you send them a note? Oh, I sent them an email. I said, no, did you send them a handwritten note? And they go, no. I said, why don't you try that? And I've got clients who've gotten business just because they sent a handwritten note. And you can now outsource that as well. You can, in fact, now turn around and go to a particular website and say, I'd like to send a handwritten note. 
which I think is fantastic, until of course you send them a second one and it's different writing and it's a bit weird. <laughs> yeah, and, and then you have to load everything up. I mean, you know, and I some people do that and they do it very well. There's you know there's a site here in the States, a couple. I just go to the dollar store and pick up discounted stationery and I have it and so when the opportunity presents itself or if I know I'm going to a workshop and someone's speaking, I already have the note and I'm going to thank them for the presentation. It's, yeah, it's, just, it's just, again, engaging with people through the written word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think taking the time to actually write it and the fact that they know you've taken the time to write it is, is the critical aspect to it and why the engagement's higher. And I think it goes back to in sales, people buy from people they know and trust. Yeah. And they buy on emotion. And who doesn't like to see a nice handwritten card in their mail whenever it ha happens? And the other hint is if you're going to do it, get some colored stationery so it doesn't look like a business envelope. <laughs> yeah, so it doesn't get put straight in the uh, uh, the, the spam folders we call it. Yeah, the, the trash can or the the it, circular yeah. file we call it here in the states. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's actually a good good point. So, if you could recommend one writing activity, what would it be? Writing handwritten notes to people, or what would you recommend as one thing to take away from today to start somebody's writing practice off? What what would you tell them to do? I write your story. Wow. I think yeah. that's where it needs to start. Write your story. What differentiates you from everybody else? What do you bring to the table? Why would someone want to buy from you? Tell your story in the written word. I, I think that's where it needs to start. And then you can pull out your 30 second or your 60 second, but make it emotionally compelling. And then, you know, take that story and then go to, like you talked earlier about your LinkedIn, and go into your LinkedIn summary, which only allows 2,000 characters. You know, plug it in there. So you right. have consistency in your message, and your message begins with your personal story. I mean, we have, you know, Paul Harvey here in the States, and he would give that little bit, and he goes, and the rest of the story, commercial break, and you would hear it. People hung around to hear the rest of the story. Yeah. So, you know, tell your story. I, and in the book, um, To Sell as Human, Daniel Pink talks about the, um, the Pixar story. So, in six sentences, can you tell your story? Yeah. Which is really, you know, it's hard, but once you get in, it kind of starts once upon a time. And in, and in six sentences, can you tell, you know, the situation, your solution, and the results? Because when you're making a movie pitch to Hollywood or wherever, they hear them all day long. They want brevity. And they want it in six sentences, going back to Einstein. You know? Yeah, I think that's right. And it doesn't matter if it's an investment pitch or a job interview, in actual fact. It could be anything and being able Absolutely. to be This is me. This is your takeaway. Fantastic. Do you have another question for us, Martha? Because you popped up before. At the moment, no. <laughs> okay, cool. Good. Fantastic. <laughs> Some people believe they can't write very well, and this was this was certainly something I had when I left school in the first place, and it was a confidence thing because uh, people around me had told me I couldn't write, even though I was fairly articulate. So what would you say in response to this belief, and how would you get people to overcome uh, writing as a, or the belief that they can't write very well? Well, I think I'd start with Henry Ford. And Henry Ford said, if you think you can or you think you cannot, either way you're correct. So yeah. your belief can be changed. And again, being willing to challenge that belief. So where do you start? You just start putting words down on paper. Like you said, Richard, just start writing. It's not going to be perfect. That's okay. But with practice, Attend some seminars. You know, go take a writing class. I don't know if there's any really good writing classes out there, but maybe there is. Listen to some webinars. Read some books. Just practice. Listen to what you like to hear. What makes you want to buy something? You know, you know. And if you want to, you know, the football, the Super Bowl commercials. Well, what made those emotionally engaging outside of the pictures? Was there something, did someone say something? 
but it all yeah. starts with practice. And it could be just as simple as you said, okay, I'm not a good writer, but I know how to write a thank you note. Start with a simple thank you note. Yeah. Just take action, do something, instead of sitting back saying, I can't. No, yes, you can. You choose not to. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that um, there were two things which started me writing. One was, uh, I wanted to write for my son when he was small. I wanted to do tailored stories for him where he would be the hero in the story. And it's, it was knights and castles and dragons, etc., and all that sort oh, of cool. spacemen, etc. And that, that worked really well because, of course, I was emotionally invested in wanting to write these things. My son gave me fantastic feedback because, of course, he loved them, which was always great. And in actual fact, it didn't matter if the spelling was quite correct or the grammar wasn't that correct because, of course, he didn't get to see that because I was reading him the story anyway. But the process of putting it down on paper helped tremendously. And, 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 go ahead. I'm sorry. And the second thing I did was I went on a uh, an afternoon's writing course, which was for business writing, and it was actually housed on a canal barge, so a boat, which went down the canals in England. And the idea was that because you weren't stuck in a classroom and there was things to talk about and you wrote about what you saw on the way through, etc., that it was not it wasn't something specific or you felt like you had to be the best in the class or try too hard, etc. And I think that whole aspect of trying too hard is a key factor. So you don't try too hard. You don't go for perfection the first time around. You will make mistakes, and it's an iterative process. And, and one final remark, and why I so believe in writing, is that I have found the more I write, the better I think. The better I think, the more I write. Yeah. And that is, I think, the essence of what makes successful people successful being able to clearly articulate their thoughts to take their thinking to that next level and that all happens in the power of just writing words down and one thing I carry with me is a little journal so if I get an idea I'll write it down I'll just jot it down real quick now some people can do this on their smartphones I don't care but taking the time to capture it at the moment because at that moment, you're probably having a thought that nobody else has had a thought of. So then go back and think. And it may take a while to <clears throat> evolve it into a story, into a posting. Absolutely. And I have to say, I'll, I'll now pop up with my incredibly small... <laughs> <laughs> that goes in my back, back of my jeans pocket for doing exactly the same. Now, I'm a gadget guy, but I find it easier to have a tiny pencil and tiny, it's an A7 size uh, notebook, and write down the, the thoughts into that, because I can take it anywhere with me. You know, I can go for, I can go for a pint in the pub, as we say over here. Uh, I can be at a business meeting or whatever, and it's so inobtrusive that I can use it whenever. And people don't question you if you write something down. They're more curious, versus if you turn around and type something onto a, a, a tablet or your smartphone, it's... It, particularly in some circumstances, it can be considered rude. I, I think it's it's a perception. <clears throat> mm. Working in a smartphone or a smart device is considered impersonal. Yeah. Writing is still considered a personal activity. Absolutely. And, and that, I think, is a difference. Yeah, I think you're absolutely correct. Now, previously, in a previous life, I um, had another business which I sold. And I had a, a co-founder. Now that co-founder, when we turned around and responded to RFPs, would always include the latest jargon and buzzwords within the response to respond, you know, an invitation to tender, whatever it's going to be. I found that frustrating because the it didn't necessarily align with what our thoughts were, but it was using the latest terminology, etc. How do you turn around to a business partner, and there's lots of small businesses with business partners out there, and get them to simplify their writing style? How would you encourage them and educate them to do that? Sometimes, for people who are a little bit more complex thinkers, do a test. They'd probably be willing to that. Write their style, write your style, send out a test and see which gets more responses. Let the public, let your ideal customer, your potential sales leads make that determination. 
That's mm -hmm. why they do split test marketing all the time. Yeah, A-B testing effectively, isn't it? Yeah. You know, that's a good idea. And in fact, you can actually go to your existing customers and say, look, I'm rewriting this. Would this appeal to you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you don't ask, you don't get. Absolutely. And I think we're about coming up on time. Am I right, Martha? Yes, you are right. Fantastic. Well, it's been lovely to have you on. It's been a real pleasure, and I've really enjoyed talking to you on a, on a personal level as well as the fact that I think this is going to be valuable to our, to our listeners as well, and our engaged audience. So again, this is Coach Lee, at Coach Lee. If you want to engage with her, if you want to tweet to her, if you want to follow her, I'm sure she would love that. And if you want to go visit her website, there's increase-sales-blog.com. There is some great content up there. I have looked at it, and I have been through it. So if you want to continue the conversation, I'm sure Coach Lee would love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Martha. Thank you. Bye. Our pleasure.